Hello everyone, this is Brooke Bradley from That Darn Data. In this presentation on probabilistic species co-occurrence, we're going to be covering this paper right here, a probabilistic model for analyzing species co-occurrence by Joseph Veach. If you download the PowerPoint slides, there are links embedded in this presentation. So you can click here to get to the paper, but you can also click here to get to thatdarndata.com and the icons will take you to my t-shirts on Amazon, my Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, and GitHub. All right, let's begin. To understand whether or not two species are co-occurring more frequently than would be expected by chance, or less frequently than would be expected by chance, we first have to ask, what's the probability of two species co-occurring? Well, this depends on a number of factors, such as the number of sites sampled and the number of sites each species is found in. So n for number of sites, n1 number of sites occupied by species 1, and n2 number of sites occupied by species 2. Using these three pieces of information, we can then calculate the probability that species one and two co-occur at a certain number of sites, which we can represent as pj. So p1, for instance, is the probability that species one and two co-occur or are found together at exactly one site. And we can calculate the probability of two species co-occurring at zero sites, one site, two sites, all the way up to n sites. And when we calculate pj for all possible values of j, we end up with a discrete probability distribution. <laughs> Pretty cool. Using this discrete probability distribution, we can then determine if the observed number of sites with both species, q obs, is higher or lower than we would expect to see. So how do we calculate pj? Well, let's think about the probability of flipping a coin and getting heads. We know it's one half because we count the number of outcomes we're interested in, heads is just one outcome, and divide by the total number of possible outcomes, heads and tails, equals two possible outcomes. Well, we can do the same thing with pj. For the numerator, we'll count the number of ways species one and two can be distributed among the n sites. So our numerator is very specific. We're looking at co-occurrence for a particular value of j. And our denominator is broad, encompassing all possible ways that we might see our two species spread out. Essentially, we'll be looking at all possible values of j from no co-occurrence up to total co-occurrence. Now the question is, what are these values? How do we count the total number of ways species 1 and 2 can co-occur for a given j? How do we count the total number of ways species 1 and 2 can be distributed in general? Let's start with the numerator. Let's say we have four sites, and both species 1 and 2 are found at two sites. We're interested in calculating P1. So what's the probability of species 1 and 2 co-occurring at exactly one site. Well, let's start by counting the number of ways we could see our two species co-occur once across our four sites. So we can draw out our four sites right here, where site 1 is represented by a square, site 2 by a hexagon, site 3 by a circle, and site 4 by whatever this shape is. So now species 1 and 2 could be co-occurring either at site 1, at site 2, site 3, or site 4. Now, for each of these four possibilities, we still need to see how many ways species 1 and 2 could be distributed among the remaining sites such that they aren't co-occurring. 
since both species 1 and 2 are only found at two sites, we only need to place them at one more site. Let's start with species 2. With three sites left, we can place species 2 in any of the three empty sites. So if species 1 and 2 co-occur at site 1, then species 2 can be found at either site 2, 3, or 4. If species 1 and 2 co-occur at site 2, species 2 can be found at either site 1, 3, or 4. Since there are four rows here, and three different ways of placing species 2 for each row, we're looking at four times three different ways of placing species 2 once the co-occurring sites have been accounted for. Now, for each of these 12 different possibilities, we have two empty sites where species 1 could be found. So if species 1 and 2 are found at site 1, and species 2 at site 2, then species 1 could be found at either site 3 or 4. So our total number of outcomes for our numerator ends up being 4 times 3 times 2, which gives us 24. But this isn't a very efficient way of counting our possible outcomes. What if you had 100 sites? What if you missed a possible arrangement? Or what if you simply miscounted? Instead, we can represent each of these three pieces of the puzzle with a combination. If you recall, the combination Y choose X gives you the number of ways to select X items from Y items without repetition. For the first part, we want to select one site for species one and two to co-occur at from the four possible sites. In other words, we're looking at N choose J. For the second part, we want to select the number of ways our remaining species two can be arranged from the sites where species one and two aren't co-occurring. Using our notation, this is N minus J choose and 2 minus j, which reduces to 3 choose 1, which is equal to 3. And finally, we'll want to select the number of ways our remaining species 1 can be arranged from the sites where species 1 and 2 aren't co-occurring and where species 2 isn't found. This ends up reducing to n minus 2 choose n1 minus j, which gives us 2 choose 1 in this scenario, which is equal to 2. So now we can rewrite the numerator in terms of our combinations. So the total number of ways species 1 and 2 could be arranged among n sites for a given n1, n2, and j is equal to n choose j times n minus j choose n2 minus j times n minus n2 choose n1 minus j. Now let's move our attention to the denominator. As we can see here, for both species 1 and 2, there are six different ways to arrange the number of sites occupied by either species 1 or species 2 among the four sites. This is equivalent to 4 choose 2, or n choose n1, or n choose n2. But again, we need to consider each combination of species 1 and species 2, which we can find by multiplying 6 times 6 to give us 36. So now we can rewrite the denominator in terms of our combinations. So the total number of ways species 1 and 2 could be arranged among n sites for a given n1 and n2 without consideration of j is equal to n choose n2 times n choose n1. Now we can combine our reformulated numerator and denominator 
to get a mathematical equation for pj. And when we calculate pj for all possible values of j, we end up with a probability distribution. But first, let's talk about what our possible values for j are. When it comes to reasonable values for j, not all values of j will make sense. j will have both a lower and an upper bound. For the lower bound, obviously negative values don't make sense, but there's another limit on the lower bound of values that j can take. Let's say, for instance, we have five sites. Species one is seen at four sites, and species two is seen at two sites. Now, because of this, they have to co-occur at at least one site. There's no getting around that. So our lower bound for J ends up being either zero or N1 plus N2 minus N, whichever is larger. So in this scenario, four plus two minus five equals one, which is larger than zero, so our lower bound for j is 1. What happens if you calculate p0? Well, nothing really, only the probability will be 0, so it's just not really interesting. Now, how about the upper bound? Well, the maximum value that makes sense for j is determined by the least abundant species. In this scenario here, that's species 2, which is found at two sites. If species 2 is only found at two sites, then it's impossible for it to be found with species 1 at more than two sites. So if you calculated P3, again, it would simply be 0. Once we know Pj for all possible values of j, we end up with a discrete probability distribution. And the great thing about discrete prob probability distributions is that they allow us to easily identify the probability of seeing a particular value. Let's look at a specific example, and we'll use this example to construct and interpret our discrete probability distribution. Imagine we've sampled 40 sites and found two llama species co-occur at four sites. Species one is present at 10 sites, and species two at 25 sites. Do these species occur more or less frequently than expected by chance? So let's break this down. In this scenario, our total number of sites, n, is 40. The number of sites occupied by species 1, n1, is 10, and species 2, n2, is 25. And finally, we have four sites where both species are found, so our q obs is equal to 4. Instead of calculating pj for each j manually, let's have our studio do the calculations for us. The first thing we'll do is define our variables. So we'll set n equal to 40, n1 equal to 10, and n2 equal to 25. Then we'll want to think about our possible values of j. Because n1 plus n2 is equal to 35, which is less than 40, it's possible for our two species to be completely spread out among the 40 sites and have no overlap at all. So our minimum value of j could be 0. Now the maximum number of times the two species can co-occur is limited by the species which occupied the fewest sites. In this case, it's species 1, so the maximum value j can be is 10. With this in mind, we can set j equal to 0 through 10. Now we'll want to calculate pj for all values of j. We'll use the equation from slide 9 to calculate pj and assign it to the variable pj. To calculate our combinations, we'll use the choose function and supply it with the variables defined above. 
So we have choose n comma j for n choose j multiplied by choose n minus j comma n two minus j. So even these calculations right here, we don't have to do. We'll just make r do it for us. That way, we can always blame R if something goes wrong. I'm just kidding. We're still responsible for what R does since we're overseeing the process. But by setting up our variables and keeping the variables in our equation, it makes it really easy if we need to change a variable for any reason. Okay, finishing up the numerator, we have all of that multiplied by n minus n2, choose n1 minus j. For the denominator, we're going to need an extra set of parentheses. So it knows to multiply the two combinations together before dividing. Inside the parentheses, we'll have n choose n2 times n choose n1. Now, luckily for us, R can be pretty smart sometimes. It will know that we want a calculation for each value of j since j is a vector. So we don't need a for loop or anything. We can run this line of code and we'll get a pj for each j. It's pretty sweet. Finally, we'll want to store all of this in a data frame for easy viewing and handling. For our data frame, we'll include each value of j, the pj associated with each j, and the cumulative sum of pj. Now, there are a couple of reasons we want to calculate the cumulative sum of pj. The first is that whenever you're dealing with probability distributions, you want to ensure that your probability sum to 1. Otherwise, you don't have a legit probability distribution. The second reason we want our cumulative sum is that it's going to help us determine whether or not two species are co-occurring more or less than we would expect if the species are independently distributed. We'll talk more about that in a couple slides. So this is what our CO data frame looks like. We have a J column, a PJ column, and the cumulative sum of pj. We can see that the cumulative sum is 1, so that's a good check that we have a legitimate distribution. Now, with all of our pj's for each possible j, we can plot the distribution of pj using the Plotly package. Now, you don't have to use Plotly for plotting. You can definitely use base r if you prefer, but I like Plotly better than base R. If you're interested, here's the code. You first need to load the Plotly package using the library function. Then you can use Plotly. Note the underscore here. So we want the J column of our CO data frame on the X axis, but we want it as a factor so it will label each J for us and the pj column of our CO data frame on the y-axis. We'll specify that it's a bar chart with type equals bar, and then we can set the color using the color argument. So here the I tells Plotly to recognize this HTML color code as is. So this is what we get when we plot our pj. We have our j's here representing the number of sites on the x-axis and the probability that two species co-occur on the y-axis. p7, for example, is the probability that the two species co-occur at exactly seven sites. What we can see from this plot is that p7 is a little over 0.25. If we look at our data frame, when j is equal to 7, we have p7 equal to 0 0.258. But if you've created this plot in R, then you can simply hover over the bar to see the exact value. That's one of the many reasons I like Plotly. But what we're really interested in is p4. 
since there are four sites where both species 1 and 2 are found. Now, if we're interested in whether or not the observed co-occurrence differs from random, we'll need to know the probability of observing that specific co-occurrence or a value more extreme than it. If the probability is less than our significance level, alpha, which is usually 0.05, then we can say there's a statistically significant difference between the co-occurrence observed and what would be expected. To assess whether or not two species co-occur less than expected, we'll want to know the probability of seeing them co-occur at least q obs times, or in our case, the probability of seeing them co-occur at least four times. To find this probability, we'll sum our pj's from zero, our minimum j, to four. p0 plus p1 plus p2 plus p3 plus p4. Now, our cumulative pj column of the CO data frame will show that our pj's 0 through 4 sum to 0 0.095, which is not less than 0 0.05. This means we can't say that the two species occur less frequently than would be expected by chance. We can also see with our graph that since our P4 probability exceeds this 0 0.05 line, we wouldn't meet significance with P4 alone. It's automatically disqualifying. Now, is it possible that our two species are co-occurring more than expected? Well, we know from the previous graph with P4 being greater than 0.05 that the answer is no. But let's look at the graph anyway. To see if two species are co-occurring more frequently than would be expected, we'd want to look at the probability of seeing them co-occur four or more times. That means we'd need to sum our pj's from four all the way through 10. We can clearly tell that this is greater than 0.05, but we could also use our cumulative sum column of the CO data frame to determine what the exact probability is. Since all of our probabilities must sum to 1, the probability of P4 through P10 is equal to subtracting P0 through P3 from 1. In other words, to find the probability P4 through P10, we can take 1 minus the cumulative sum of the probabilities up to Pj. This will give us 0.98. As expected, this is not less than 0.05. Now, let's look at what co-occurrence values would be less than expected and generalize our expression from the previous slides. When thinking about two species co-occurring less than expected, the probability of seeing them co-occur at least q obs times should be less than 0.05. This means that summing our pj's from the smallest j value, which we can represent as the maximum of either 0 or n1 plus n2 minus n, all the way up to q obs. The q obs that meets the significance level in this scenario would be 3, since the cumulative probability of p 0 through P3 is 0 0.0175. Any value more extreme than 3, like 0, 1, or 2, would also meet significance. As we saw earlier, once we look at P4, the cumulative sum of the probabilities exceeds the 0 0.05 significance level. When thinking about two species co-occurring more than expected, the probability of seeing them co-occur q obs times or more should be less than 0.05 to meet significance. This means summing our pj's from q obs all the way up to our maximum j, 
which can be represented by the minimum of N1 and N2. The minimum Q obs that meets the significance level in this scenario would be 9, since 1 minus the cumulative sum of Pj's 0 through 8 is 0 0.04, which is less than 0 0.05 including 8 would push the cumulative sum of the probabilities past 0.05. If you're looking at multiple pairs of species, you're probably not going to want to go through the process we just did to look at co-occurrence for every single pair. It's simply not an efficient process. Instead, we can use the co-occur package created by Daniel Griffith, Joseph Beach, and Charles Marsh. With the co-occur package, you simply provide it with a presence-absence matrix, and it will do all of the work for you. I'll be adding a tutorial for using the co-occur package if you're interested in using it for your own research. Well, that's all for this presentation. This is Brooke Bradley from That Darn Data. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up so I know to make more like it. If you have questions or ideas for another video, please leave a comment below. Finally, I like to make nerdy t-shirts in my free time. If you're interested in some nerdy ecological data science swag, this t-shirt is available on Amazon and the tote and sticker can be found at Society6. I'll put some links below. Obviously, no pressure, but... If you do buy something and you feel like sending me a picture on Instagram, that would make my freaking day. And speaking of good days, I hope you all have a good one. Catch you later.